you know, it is a weird season, right? A weird time. And it's, it's so fluid and evolving. And, and leaders, no matter what you're a leader of, you're praying about how to, how to proceed forward, uh, whether it's uh, things going on in our culture or whether it's COVID. And we want you guys to know that we do have some people in our church that have had COVID. And uh, throughout these several months, we have a few people that have it now. And I want to just explain to you again that um, why we're having church. And, and I don't think there's one reason that every church say, this is what we're going to do and this is who we are. But for us, you know, I was even wrestling through it while we were worshiping this morning. But, but for me, it's kind of settled in this place of, I feel like we just have to gather and worship Jesus. That's no, that's, that's no knock on anyone that's not there that feels like the right thing, to do, right thing for them to do is stand at home, stay at home or churches that aren't gathering together. But we feel, I feel it's important for us to continue to gather together and worship Jesus. That doesn't mean we're standing and saying like, oh, there's no way that we will get sick. What we are saying is we are going to pray, we are going to trust the Lord, and we are going to gather and worship Jesus. And I believe it's training for things that are still to come. And uh, this isn't all negative. God is going to use it for his glory. So let's, as I pray, I want to pray also for those who are sick and also just pray protection over all of us. Can we do that? So God, right now, Lord, those that have recovered, Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, those that have been sick, Lord, that are sick right now, we pray healing over their bodies in Jesus' name. And God, for everyone here, God, we pray protection in the name of Jesus. God, it's hard to navigate these times. So would you, as Sharia prayed while ago, would you give us wisdom every step of the way? And God, would you watch over and protect your church? Not just that she would be protected from physical things, but spiritually, Lord, that she would mature and grow and get more beautiful. Holy Spirit, guide over the word this morning and, and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turning your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We are in a series talking about walking with Holy Spirit. Intentionally trying to, you know, for years I've been trying to teach myself to kind of drop the the before Holy Spirit because it just tends to make him more impersonal. It makes him more impersonal. You know, if I was talking about Victor and I called him the Victor, well, then that just doesn't sound as personal. So learning to make him more personal. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Let's read this here. This is really kind of just what we're going for. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you all. So Paul closes out this letter to the church in Corinth with this blessing. Like his blessing is, man, I pray that you guys would know the grace of Jesus that you would know the love of God the Father, and that you would know fellowship, of whole, you know what it means to have fellowship with Holy Spirit. Now, I think it's really important for us to dig into all three of those things. Like, we've got to get what does it mean to walk in the grace of Jesus. That unmerited favor that we get because Jesus died on our cross and paid the price for our sins. What does it mean to live in this place of like, man, I, I have been redeemed because of Jesus. Man, it's so important for us to understand what it means to know the love of God. And I think we're on, this, we're on this journey, right? Can you all guys kind of be with me in that? You're on a journey of understanding the grace of Jesus. You don't fully grasp it yet, right? Like, there's, it's so deep. It's so beautiful. Like, how do we get to the end of it? And then the love of the Father, like, man, where maybe as you, as you walk with Jesus, you start to learn a little bit more how much the Father loves you. And, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? And so we're growing in the love of the Father. But then... We get to this part, Paul says, I pray that you would know what it means to have fellowship with Holy Spirit. And do we know that? Do we get it, guys? And this is the journey we're on right now, is we're trying to dig in to understand what it means to have fellowship with Holy Spirit. Now, to have fellowship with someone, you've, you've got to get to know them, right? They can't be at a distance. And in fact, the more you get to know someone, the deeper that fellowship can be. Um, you know, the more I study Kim, my wife, the more I know her, the more I, more I know what she loves and what she doesn't love, the more, the more I know what, what bothers her, the more I know, the, you know what, what blesses her, the deeper our intimacy and our fellowship is. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to understand who is Holy Spirit, what does he care about? What's his character? What's his nature? Because the more we understand like what's on his heart and what's on his mind, the more we'll be able to fellowship with him. So guys, we're inviting you on a journey to, to get this. How do we develop fellowship with Holy Spirit? 
And so we struggle with this relationship, I think, a lot of times because we don't understand his ministry. And what I mean by that is he has a specific ministry. Jesus right now is sitting on the throne at the right hand of God, interceding for us as a high priest, and we need to understand that ministry. Well, do we understand the ministry of Holy Spirit right now? What is he up to? What's he trying to do? And that's what we need to grasp this morning. So I want to talk to you. This is kind of a continuation from last week. I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit's ministry of sanctification. Now, we try, I don't know why we try, but we try to like stay away from these, stay away from these big, long, like doctrinal words because something's happened in the church, I think, that, you know, we, we think that doctrine or we think that these big Christian words are somehow religious and not necessary. But guys, these doctrines were created based on truth from the Word of God to help us walk with God and be all that we can be. So doctrine isn't a bad word. It is truth from the Word of God of how, how, we, how we are Christians, how we follow G- Jesus. And sanctification is not a bad word. It's one of those terms that, that even though we kind of don't talk about it much, it's super important for us to under, understand the truths behind it. So we're going to dig into it this morning. So sanctification, first of all, let's, let's define the word. It is made up of two Greek words put together that mean this, to make holy. And so this is what we're going to talk about, the ministry of Holy Spirit. And so I I want you to think, or or let me just go ahead and say, I think the church, when we think about Holy Spirit, we mainly think about power. And we forget the other ministries that he has. And so sanctification means to make holy or to set apart or to separate. And what is he separating us from? And we're kind of just building this where each scripture will make sense. He is setting apart, and he is separating us from sin. He's making us holy. This is his, his goal, his job inside of our hearts, inside of our lives, to make us holy. 1 Corinthians six eleven says this, But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. So here, guys, I want you, I'm going to read several verses here. I want to, what I'm trying to do is lay a foundation that sanctification is an important issue or doctrine or truth in the Word of God. So we see it in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. We were sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. I'm probably going quicker than you can turn, but I think it'll be on the screen. says this, that this is the will of God for you, that you are sanctified. God's will for your life is that you're sanctified. 1 Peter 1.1 Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces, and he lists them, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So 1 Peter says that we are sanctified by a work of Holy Spirit. Are you guys with me? 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved, here we go, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So now we've seen it four times. Let's read a fifth. Romans 15.14 I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, Filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another, yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of, the gr- because of the grace God gave me. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty. Listen to this. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So we just read five different portions of Scripture that talked about the Holy Spirit sanctifying us. Now here's what I want you to get as we dig into it. The Bible talks more about the Holy Spirit's ministry of of, of sanctifying us than it does His ministry of empowering us. It's not neglecting His power, because we're going to get into that. But it's, it's elevating, or it's talking about, man, the Holy Spirit, one of his primary works inside of the believers is to set us apart and separate us from sin. Now, we're talking about having fellowship with him. 
and knowing him and going deeper with him, if we don't understand that one of the things, he doesn't wake up because he doesn't slumber, but, but like if he woke up, it's like, man, what's on my heart today? And he's looking at you, he's like, man, I want to make you holy. I want you to be holy. I want to separate you from the sin in your life. A few examples here, guys. When you decide, and there could be many, obviously, when you decide to quit watching shows that have questionable scenes in them, you've, you're convicted and you stop watching that, that's sanctification. That's something that's happening inside of you. When you get free from an addiction or you decide, man, I'm not going to do that anymore, that's sanctification. When you start treating your spouse better, that's sanctification. When you start tithing and giving, it's sanctification. When you quit cheating on your taxes, that's sanctification. When you stop cursing, it's sanctification. When you forgive someone, that is the sanctifying work of Holy Spirit inside of us. When you quit blowing up and having fits of rage, that is Holy Spirit sanctifying us, setting us apart, separating us from sin. When you get up early and spend time in the Word of God and in prayer, that's sanctification. When you're attacked and yet you humble yourself and don't respond, that's sanctification. We're trying to learn what it means to have fellowship with Holy Spirit, and I think a lot of times we're not really aware of what he's trying to do. He's looking at you, and he's, he's getting this image of you, and he's comparing it to this image of Jesus. And he's trying to get you to look like Jesus. He's wanting to change you. People get confused here, and here, here comes the rub or the tension. Because people say and think, well, I thought I was made right before God. Why is the Holy Spirit trying to change me if I've been made right before God? Well, that is a different doctrine. That's justification. And what's happened in the church is we, we, we grabbed a hold of sanctification many times. I mean, justification, like I've been made right with God, and we don't realize that there is a work, that, that we've been made righteous before God eternally, but that doesn't mean we're living righteously. And God is concerned about both things in our lives. So justification is this. Because of the cross and believing in Jesus, we are justified before God. We are made right before him. We will stand before him one day, and he will look at you if you know Jesus, and he will say these words, not guilty. Not guilty. Because of the blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, we read it a while ago and read it again. But you were washed, and you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. In other words, in Christ, Jesus Christ, he justifies us, but the Spirit sanctifies us. We are made righteous before God in the sense that he says, you will not have to pay the price for your sins. But that does not mean that he does not have a goal for us to live righteously. To be made righteous and to live righteously are different things. And in the church today, I mentioned this last week, there is a lot of false teaching that says our sin doesn't matter. And I, what I would say this, it doesn't matter in the light of eternity when you stand before God. It absolutely matters this side of heaven. In fact, if we say that it doesn't matter, then we are saying we are not allowing Holy Spirit, we are not invited into my life to do one of the primary things you want to do. The Spirit of God not only declares us righteous, He begins the process of making us righteous. We are being counted as righteous even though we are not living righteously. Let me say that again. We are counted righteous even though we are not currently living righteously. What I mean by that is there's still rebellion in our lives. And these doctrines do not have to be separate. They, they actually are both completely true. So we have justification and sanctification. Now here's a great verse for both of them. We'll read this one a little slower. 2 Corinthians 4.13. 2 Corinthians 4.13. Paul says, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. 
Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. That's justification. We'll be presented before the Lord made righteous. Verse 15. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. That's sanctification. We will be presented before the Lord, made righteous, but guys, we're being renewed day by day. If it doesn't matter how we're living, why are we being, made, why are we being renewed daily? And you may think, like, why is this a problem? I think it's a problem because we don't understand this, and our, our theology gets off. We don't understand how to relate with God. We get miserable, we get confused, and we fall into sin. Day by day means it's a process. This should bring us comfort because here's what I find that's happening in the church a lot. We, we have a moment, we have a mountaintop experience, and, we, and we're excited, and we think, man, I'm done. Right? I'm done. I'm, I've conquered. It's over. I'm moving on. We're flying on, I mean, I'm flying on the wings of eagles. Nothing can ever stop me. And then tomorrow comes. If you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, you will know that we are getting renewed day by day. That the mountaintop experiences where we think, and even, they even inform the way we pray, guys. In other words, we pray many times like in a way that this happened, it's done, it's over no more. And we don't realize, man, he's going to keep working on me again tomorrow. He's never going to be through working on me. It's not lacking faith. It's understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. Praise God for those times when we're flying on the, on the wings of eagles. But we need to understand that he is going to keep working on us until. Until the rapture, until we go to heaven, until something changes. He's going to keep working on us day by day. It is very clear in Scripture he's working on us. Now, it, why would he work on us if it didn't matter how we live? No, he's sanctifying us every day. I want to say, this is him speak. I want to set you apart to make you holy. I want to separate you from sin. Guys, there's no doubt and we're going to get into this more in a few weeks, that one of the ministries of Holy Spirit is to empower us for God's purposes. Acts 1.8, Jesus says to the disciples, but you will receive power. When what? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And we know what happened in this story. The Spirit of God does fall on the, on, the, on the apostles. And, man, they go out and they are preaching the gospel and signs and wonders and miracles. People are, are getting healed. Like, the, the Holy Spirit absolutely wants to empower us. And what I find is that, that in the church, it seems like that we think that that's like his ministry and that's it. And he's, he really has this dual ministry where he's working on the inside of us and on the outside of us, meaning this, that he's working on the inside, he's renewing us, he's changing us, he's sanctifying us, and he's, he's coming upon us that we may be empowered to do miracles, preach the gospel, all those things. I said this while I go, but I want to say it again. He actually talks more about the Spirit's sanctifying work in Scripture than he does his empowering work. So why would that be the case? Let's look at the life of Jesus for just a moment. Luke 4. Just read a few verses here. Luke 4, verse 1. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. So we know the story. Jesus is led by the Spirit out into a place, out into wilderness, be tempted by the devil. Did he ever succumb to those temptations? No? Good. We all know that. Go down to verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through all the surrounding districts. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Jesus left after verse 14, and he goes out. His ministry begins. He starts healing people, right? He, he raises Lazarus from the dead. He, he heals Kai, uh, Jairus' daughter. He heals lepers. He, people are, are coming to God. They're, they're being redeemed and challenged and changed. And, man, he's walking in power, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But he started by being led into the Spirit, being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he came out walking in the power of God, right? Jesus, what, what I want you to get to see is this. I hope this makes sense. Um, Jesus had no need to be sanctified. He had no need to be separated from sin. And so he was able to walk out in the power of God with great power. Now we in the church, we start believing these, these things that we'll do greater things than Jesus. And we, we start grabbing a hold of these tr actual truths like, man, we will go out and, and we'll pray for the sick and they'll recover. We'll raise the dead. We'll, we'll preach the gospel. People get saved. We start believing that there's something in our life and then we go for it and it fails. Right? I mean, if, if, if I praise God we've seen people healed, but I feel like we've seen way more people not. Jesus came out, and every single thing that he did worked out. There's something about no, there's something about his holiness that drew great power. So in the church, we struggle. With we, we get that the Holy Spirit wants to do power, but we don't realize that he wants to sanctify us. And because he's one person trying to, to accomplish a, a, a single singular mission, we don't marry those things together. They're not just two separate works. They are, they are in a sense, one work, two phases. His ultimate goal isn't that you're sanctified. His ultimate goal isn't that you walk in power. His ultimate goal is that people would bow their knees to King Jesus that they would be saved. And therefore, what he does to, to accomplish that is he sanctifies us, he's changing us, he's drawing us, and then he's empowering us. But too much of the church wants to walk out in power and live and sin behind the scenes, right? We don't value like this idea of, of you know, I hate that we even have to put an adjective in front of holiness, but let's just do extreme holiness or like everything matters. Every choice, everything we do, the way we live, it matters. Our effort, our spending time with God, our looking at pornography, our whatever it is, it all matters. So we shouldn't be in this camp that just end up saying, like, hey, I just want to be sanctified and changed. And we shouldn't be in this camp that says, hey, I just want to walk in the power. It should be like, man, I want to be on mission for God. And that means me getting holy and me walking in power. We have got to embrace both those things equally at the same time and realize because of the work of, of one Holy Spirit, they are tied together. Now here's, man, it's, it's so hard to, to wrestle with, with saying this because what happens inevitably then is that we go out, we pray for someone, we do some of those second healing, we pray for someone to get healed, they don't get healed, and then the reflection becomes, well, is it because of sin in my life? Is it my fault then that this person getting healed? And that's a hard thing to wrestle through, grapple with, and, and land somewhere on. I think that's the wrong question. We won't understand why everything doesn't happen out the way we think it should until we get to ask God some questions one day. One day. But let's just rest on what we know to be true in Scripture. God's calling me to be holy, and he's calling me to walk in power. And I'm not going to let my lack of understanding of what happens and what doesn't happen keep me from pursuing both. But the reality is, guys, the more we walk in holiness, the more we'll walk in power. The more we surrender and yield, the more power that we'll have. We need to understand this partnership of holiness and power. I want to read you one more verse. It's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. It is this, we're looking in a mirror, and the Holy Spirit is, is looking in the mirror. And he's saying, man, I'm trying to shape you into an image that is, that when you look in the mirror, and, and he looks in the mirror, it's like, I see Jesus. That image isn't merely one of walking in power, it's one of holiness, it's one of complete obedience and surrender to the will of God. The Bible says that Jesus didn't do anything that he didn't see the Father doing. Anything that he wasn't led to do, he didn't do. He was completely consumed with, God, I just want to honor you. I think it's interesting that, you know, the word for, for Holy Spirit, of course, the word spirit is pneuma, but the, the Greek word for Holy Spirit um, is the exact same word for the holy part of sanctification. And what I mean by that is this, is when his name, when God decided to name him for us, I think he was trying to be descriptive that we would understand what he's about and what he, what he cares about and what he's up to, and he called him Holy Spirit. He didn't call him fun spirit, even though he can be fun. He didn't call him power spirit, even though he's powerful. He called him Holy Spirit. Because this was the term that most communicates his essence. So guys, if we're going to have fellowship with Holy Spirit, we've got to understand what he's up to. We've got to yield to it, like to wake up in the morning and, and say, man, Holy Spirit, what are you... What do you want to do? What do you want to do in me? Please, please, please kind of elevate and raise to the top whatever, you're, whatever you want to that can be dealt with today. We won't go into deep fellowship with him if we don't understand him. And we won't go into deep fellowship with him if we don't understand his holiness and his mission. So we're going to get in in a few weeks to the power side of, of who he is and, and what that means. But I feel it's negligent to talk about power without talking about holiness first. So let's, let's pursue him. Let's have fellowship with him. Let's ask him to examine our lives and do whatever he wants to do. Let's get purified. There's a great mission over your life. And it won't be fulfilled apart from the Holy Spirit. So realize how important it is and, and go for it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we want to yield to you. We want to understand you. We want to understand your ministry. We thank you, Father, that, that Holy Spirit, that your spirit is here on the earth to walk with us, to comfort us, to teach us, to empower us, to make us holy. And I pray that we would deepen our understanding. That we are living in a time and a season where, where the world needs people truly walking with Holy Spirit. The end is near, and, and people need to be walking with Holy Spirit. As I read a few weeks ago, Lord, the, the, the Scriptures teach us that in the end, most hearts will go cold. Well, I believe if we are in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, our hearts won't grow cold. We'll be yielding to what you want to do in us, and not trying to, to fit you into our lives, but, but allowing ourselves to be invited into what you want. Shreya spoke of an army earlier. I pray for an army that's, that knows fellowship with Holy Spirit, intimacy, intimacy, sensitive, not grieving, not grieving you. We don't want to grieve you right now. We want to yield to you.
Come and sanctify us, and purify us, and empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't want this to sound disrespectful of Holy Spirit at all because I know what this, this girl's heart was behind it. Years ago, we were on this same journey of, hey, I want to know what it means to have fellowship with Holy Spirit. And because there's this the Holy Spirit, it makes him sound, you know, Jesus, you know, has a name, you know, it sounds, sounds personal, like we get excited for the name of Jesus. And so again, I don't mean this to sound disrespectful. I'm using that as example because her heart behind it was to pursue this relationship. So she started calling Holy Spirit George simply for the fact of trying to make him personal. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a disrespectful thing. I actually love her heart behind it that she was like trying to teach herself and train herself. Like, I want to have fellowship with someone who's real, who's real. So I'm, I'm challenging you, do whatever it takes have fellowship with him. Do whatever it takes to get to know him. I love that it says Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. He didn't say, it didn't say like Jesus told the Father what to do and then Jesus did it. But yet that's what most people or some people do with Holy Spirit. We, we have a lot of plans in our life and we invite him into them and tell him what we need and what we want. Instead of realizing he has the perfect plan, let's just jump in it. So I, I want you guys to to know what it means to walk with him and to fellowship with him. And let's hit that journey. All right? Why don't you stand? Bless someone from a distance. As you leave this morning, thank you guys for worshiping with us. We love y'all. Be safe, be healthy. You guys are dismissed.